On Friday, Apprentice Braden offered an invitation to yours truly to attend his enlistment ceremony. The following day, yours truly informed Apprentice Braden that the only possible conclusion of an invitation would be for yours truly to speak, and related to Apprentice Braden that a speech and invocation was nearly finished, and in due time a copy would be submitted to his superior for approval. Quote, to behold suffering gives pleasure, but to cause another to suffer affords an even greater pleasure, end quote, the genealogy of morals. Of course, not all suffering should be considered as physical suffering. Witness the uncomfortableness that arises from pranks, such as convincing someone that a speech, no doubt long-winded and rambling, has been duly prepared and will be shortly submitted, wherein the mental anguish of the person on the receiving end of the prank telling the prankster that the intention of the invitation was not to give either a speech or an invocation, but to only be present as a witness. We have learned from the best, Plato, the father of plausible scenarios and lying innocently. We assure the general reader that the individual some people call the greatest occultist of the 21st century will not break character, the will to prank, Capricorn, all to Capricorn. Although speeches and invocations are not typical written genres for yours truly, nor are they unknown to us in their spoken form. Several members of the group formerly known as the High Schoolers have enlisted, all without any speeches, benedictions, or fanfare from yours truly. In light of these facts, does George show favoritism? Is a reasonable question, and our response is that none of those who enlisted ask or invited us to attend, and what is true for vampires is valid for good manners. To arrive unexpectedly is in bad taste. Regardless of the reason or reasons, Invitations were not issued, ranging from oversight to indifference. Yours truly has never wavered in supporting their choices. Once an enlistment has been confirmed, rather than planned, the following message was publicly sent on social media. Today, in has begun a path that will be both rewarding and challenging, and we wish him all the best. In our mind's ear, we hear a certain apprentice wondering aloud, Who is in? Hint. Apprentice Colton, substitute in for a name. Let us expressly state that the substitution of names of RJ, Denver Joe, or anyone else, whether known to us or not, for Braden, does not invalidate what is written, but verifies our observations, thoughts, deductions, and conclusions over the previous two years regarding the high schoolers, generally, and those who choose to serve specifically. In conclusion, we may state that there is a type of personality or temperament that is ideally suited for a vocation in the military. Plato designated these select individuals as guardians, whose sole purpose is to protect the Republic from enemies. During one's life, there will be only a handful of memorial dates that one will experience, such as one's marriage and birthdays of children. These dates are difficult to forget, not only for months of anticipation that lead up to the event itself, but for the subsequent importance of those days. We may justly add the day of one's enlistment to our short list of memorable dates. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed with their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. This opening of the second paragraph of the Declaration of Independence is easily overshadowed by the further listing of abuses endured by the colonists. Yet these actions by the Crown would not be rightly considered abuses if either kings had a divine right to rule, or their subjects had no recourse to another, higher authority. The idea of man's equality is not original to our founding fathers. This concept is found in certain books and was discussed in various circles for generations, if not centuries. However, to declare in a permanent published political document, as opposed to hushed words and whispers in dark corners, that man has rights due entirely to the dignity of man as man, was revolutionary. Had our Founding Fathers wrote that our rights come from government, then they would have no reason to describe the actions of the Crown as abuses, the King being both the end and beginning of government. By assigning man's rights as originating from the Creator, the implication is that these rights existed before the foundation of any city or any country. Hence, it is not within the authority of any government at any time, as governments represent people, not the Creator, to justly deny or interfere with these rights. The idea that people should be allowed to follow their own interests, whether political, religious, or financial, was also revolutionary. This individual self-interest may be called the pursuit of happiness. Selfishness, or placing one's interests before others, 
is typical of mankind, and if everyone acts rationally in their own interests, then, given enough time, everyone benefits, at least in the short term. The evidence for the unforeseen benefits of self-interest are well documented since our founding. No one in 1776 could foresee that three million generally unremarkable colonists would be the start of a world power, eventually more influential than the English, French, or Spanish at the height of their respective empires. Our nation could have easily become one composed mostly of merchants and farmers, each seeking his own self-interest and enjoying success seeking his own pleasure. However, history clearly teaches that there have always been certain individuals who want to impose their values upon others by their either in intimidation or force, and it is unlikely there will be a lack of those individuals in the future. Citizens using their liberty to pursue their own happiness without other considerations cannot long endure, as there will come a time when enemies of the state will wish to forcefully impose their views, opinions, and worldview upon those self-same citizens. Necessity dictates that if a nation wishes to be free now and for future generations, then certain individuals are required in every generation to put the security of their country, including those they will never know, before their own naturally selfish interests of pleasure and happiness. I suggest that Braden acquired this unselfish trait, among other virtues, and various qualities from myself, through a type of transference and known to modern science. These transferences must have occurred during our infrequent conversations over the last two years. I feel this explanation is the best, but if it is not completely satisfactory, then I suggest that Braden acquired his views from his peers. Of course, his peers have various, and no doubt when considered as a whole, conflicting views, so it is more likely Braden was influenced by a select number of like-minded mentors than by his numerous peers. Of course, we cannot dismiss Braden's family as a significant positive influence. The evidence for this is Braden himself. Yet not everyone who has a good family enlists, and family, like peers and mentors, have conflicting opinions, even concerning such mon mundane topics as what to have for dinner. Of course, if Apprentice Denver is involved, it is unlikely any agreement will be forthcoming. We state the obvious. Braden is not unique, as we all have mentors, peers, and family. However, over time and from a multitude of influences, Braden must have accepted certain ideas as good while rejecting others as bad. We are curious and we ask, how and by what methods did Braden choose certain beliefs while dismissing others that led him to enlist rather than another course of action? I suspect the truth of this matter is that Braden has always possessed specific traits and certain characteristics that assisted his decision to choose military service. And while certain essentials, such as the proper role of government, the concepts of political philosophy and military training can be taught, they are external criteria. A self-motivated individual is a requirement for success in these demanding endeavors. Braden has not acquired the prerequisites for service and duty from anything external, whether from any individual, yours truly included, or from any group, whether peers, mentors, or family, Braden's virtues are internal and have their origin from the Creator. Therefore, Braden always possessed virtues, among other admirable qualities, and the culmination of their non-contradictory expression is his enlistment. The Master commands that what is freely received should be freely given, and we have understood this solely in terms of learning, and while this interpretation is not incorrect, it is not complete as the commandment is applicable, perhaps more so, to inherent virtues. Braden's enlistment fulfills the ideal of giving freely what he has freely received from his Creator. As the Apostle teaches, Braden has put away selfish wants and childish thoughts, and now begins his duties and responsibilities as a guardian of our Republic. On this memorial day, as we bow our heads in humility to the one who resides in ineffable light, let us recall many of the innumerable blessings we have received from our Creator. We ask you, in your never any goodness, to continue to watch over Braden and all who serve in our armed forces. We ask you, in your internal wisdom, to assist and guide our leaders. We ask you, in your limitless power, to protect our service members and our leaders. Amen.